Garrity and Peter Corbin are involved with a project called Smart Communities New Brunswick. The idea is to apply new technology and large-scale databases to help with collective decision-making. Our conversation ranged from seniors and their needs to public transportation to how do we make New Brunswick a better place. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Because you could sit here and you could broadcast and talk to somebody yeah. three quarters of the way around the world yeah. and have the conversation. So instead of somebody jumping on a plane, coming here, hotel, at all costs, yeah. you're, you're talking. And, yeah. and, and that's, as a, as a society, that's where we're going. Uh, uh, on the social end of it, I think um, when you talk about seniors and youth, and, and, and this goes back, to, and I wanted to jump into the conversation, is, is, is self-esteem. You know, somebody that doesn't have a job, they, they, they get into a rut, and it's, it's hard to come out. They have to, everybody wants to be useful to do something. Mm -hmm. right? and, and just because somebody retires, they get all, we're, we're sidelining all that experience. Well, why couldn't they mm -hmm. come back and help people like in, in the schools that are struggling with math or, or you know, if somebody wants to be a lawyer, they can, you know, there, there's that information, you know, and, and Peter said, well, down at uh, the Red Lantern Tavern, uh, there's a group of people that are going to talk about Law 101. They want to go down, jump in. I don't need a certificate. I don't yeah. need anything. <laughs> but I, if I want to go to the university, and I talk to some of the university people, said, I want to go, but I don't want to. I don't want a degree. I just want to sit in and talk to people with like interests. Yep. Where whatever it is, you know, if you know, if it could be astrology, it could be archaeology, but I mean, you're learning something. Yep. And you're attached to something, and that's where we have to get at. So, uh, smart city, smart communities are about partnerships. We've got a, some great universities here, and right here is a big living lab. Mm -hmm. So. The city's been talking to when we lost all those trees at, at when Arthur blew through. Like I, we never put a dollar value on, so they come up and they put a dollar value. On. It was about eight hundred million dollars. That's a huge loss. Yeah. So we turned to the county and said, "Do we appreciate that or do we depreciate that?" <laughs> yeah. They were scratching their heads. Yeah, well, right? maybe it doesn't even fit in the accountant's yeah. ledger. You know, so maybe it's a it's, it's, thing. That's right. It's it's well something new, something different, and yeah. you know. Uh, so it's creating those relationships that if we can say, look, you, you've got your students there, bring them in and get some experience right in the living lab in the yeah. cities and yeah. in some of the small communities. Yeah. St. Thomas University with the Age Friendly come in. They come in and from the social work group. They help us out. Uh, and I know uh, the Renaissance College at UMB have come in and, and, and they're helping out. So, I mean, it's, it's creating those connections. It's like a big, uh, the old... Uh, Telephone operators, or yeah. you, you got to start connecting. Them. Yep. Talk, you know, yep. everybody and every community. So why can't uh, the village of Toke Town have a problem? They know St. John's done a lot of work. And they get on the phone and talk it and say, listen, yeah. can you help us? Sure. Yeah. That's what we got to get at. Yeah. So to, to build on that, sorry, for, with, the, with respect to access, um, I think you can also look at it in the context that the technology could help improve Mm -hmm. uh, quality of life for those that may not have access yet. Mm -hmm. I'll give you two examples. One earlier was the food bank one, right? So using technology that's not necessarily accessed uh, by that population uh, to help them access, you know, certain things to help their quality of life. And I'll give you one other example. Uh, in Parkland County, Alberta, which is a few kilometers west of Edmonton, it's a rural community, so it's about 60,000 population. There's a one uh, city in it, sorry, town, about 30,000 population, very rural. And uh, there's a young lady out there who looks after the internet service uh, for the county. It's more than just, you know, Rogers or Telus or, or Bell or whatever, but she's basically their landlord on 20 towers in this county. And they're using the internet to enable access itself. So, for example, one of the things that they do uh, for the less fortunate is you can actually sign out uh, internet hub, so basically Wi-Fi for your house for a week, out of the library. And uh, also you can sign out a, 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 a laptop as well, discreetly. It's a Google a Chrome laptop. But you can actually sign out of the library, internet access. So I think there's a lot of ways these tools can be used in the back end 
to help improve accessibility long term as well. Yeah, because yeah. one of the why I asked that question is one of the great challenges with implementing some changes, and we need to start making some changes, is how do we get everyone in on it at more or less the same time so that there's the social equity issue that continues to dominate. You know, because that's one of those higher perspective lenses that we look through and go, well, we're fixing this and fixing that, but we still have an inequity issue. So that would kind of show that. That's why I wanted it to surface. I would show that this is going to be for everyone, not just for those that can afford the, the new $1,000 phone and can put in all the apps and, and have the wherewithal, the literacy, to know how to manage all that. So if libraries and community access points for getting access to the technology without it being an overhead cost for your household because you got to cover off your groceries because the heat bill was higher. Right. That dynamic. Um, so that's a good message to get out early in this exercise. It's about the whole community um, coming together. It is 100% about the whole community. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you mentioned change, and the only thing that won't change is change yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, back when the province started these access centers, when computers were coming online, not everybody in every home could afford a computer. Yep. So throughout the province, the, the I think it was an excellent program, the, the province were setting these access centers. So you can go in and use the internet, research, it was for, for kids and that. And I remember going to the, Frederick, uh, to the uh, Northside Library, and we had a grant to put an access center in. Hmm. So the technology teacher at the time said, well, we could use a room, but the library would be perfect. You know, kids go in, they do research, they write their essay there. You know, old technology, new technology, it's a changeover. Yep. So when we met with the few members of the board, they they, they thought we they looked, at, looked at us if they had three eyes. <laughs> they didn't, no, no, you can't do this, and we get no staff for that, and I said, okay, so we went with plan B. Have a plan B. There was this, a room in the Nassauxis Middle School. That's where it was. It was next door to the tech teacher. Everything worked fine. Within seven or eight months, Bill Gates came in and said, we're giving computers away free to libraries. <laughs> Guess what? The library was now in business. So, yeah. But then again, changes hit again, and computers are more access. Our, the phones now are like computers, so yeah. therefore these access centers have have lost their importance because now it's people can get on the internet more. It's yeah. more accessible. Yeah, so that's that's change accessible. and change again. So yeah. you got to get one step ahead and two step ahead and try yeah. to get be a little visionary about it. And yeah. Where are we going with this stuff? And a slight change in direction of conversation. Um, can you walk us into some nuts and bolts of how it works? So we've talked, you know, broad brush, social stuff, some examples of where it might apply, but we haven't got into... Um, you know, what is a large data set? How do you build a large data set? How do you start mining that data set? Because that's got to be one element to what this does. Because mm -hmm. there's a desire for humans to know what's going on. And all the way back to Darwin, and he's got to record everything he's looking at, right? So there's a, something in us that wants to know all the pieces. Or if it's some people, when they go clothes shopping, they have to touch every piece of fabric on the rack before they decide which one that they want, right? <laughs> yeah. There's something in us that needs to know that before we can make a decision or consider we're making an informed decision. Does this help with that part of the human nature of all of this? I will give you two examples of partially human nature, but also can relate to quality of life again. Uh, one is um, you hear on the headlines when there's an extreme weather event, you know, when uh, the flooding happened in Perth, Andover a few years ago, a number of homes had to be moved. Mm -hmm. There was a physical cost to that. Or the ice storm in the peninsula last year, there was, you know, so many millions of dollars worth of infrastructure lost. Yeah. You see on the front page of the paper the cost to the physical infrastructure. You do not see the cost to the healthcare system or those individuals from a physical and mental health perspective. So, for example, when you talk about big data, uh, the University of New Brunswick through the, and I'll never get this acronym right, M-B-I-R-D-T. Basically, uh, UMB is now housing big data from the province and a lot of healthcare records, for example. Now, they are they are protected. They are secure from, from a privacy mm -hmm. perspective. But imagine now, so this is actually a project that Dr. Louise Camo, who I'm sure you know at UMB, is interested in doing, is now looking at the mental, uh, the co cost from a mental and physical health perspective related to extreme weather events. So, for example, you see on the front page of the paper, $10 million or whatever for, for Perth Andover, but what was the cost to the healthcare system 
as a result of that. Perhaps there are a lot of people that are still suffering uh, from, from anxiety as a result of this. Maybe every spring, you know, their anxiety goes up and they're going to the doctor. There's a hard cost there, right? Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about the individual from their uh, health uh, perspective, but also, quite frankly, the, the cost of the healthcare system. That's one example, not to mention incidents with, you know, is, is, uh, is Johnny okay in his house or there are issues around, you yeah. know, uh, gas poisoning or whatever. So there's a use where big data can be married against uh, what can happen to improve resiliency in, in a community, as mm -hmm. an example. Yeah. Another similar one, we talked about the aging population earlier and wanting to help people um, live in their homes longer safely. So the three big issues uh, generally are uh, the risk of a fall, uh, dementia, and uh, a pill cocktail. Either you take the wrong drugs at the right time or not enough or enough or whatever. So again, from a big data perspective, and we're talking a lot of healthcare data here, right? So imagine now you're doing a, an experiment where you have uh, a few hundred homes with people living in them where you've outfitted those homes with a lot of physical and technological uh, aids to live in those homes more safely and compare that population over time to a popular similar demographic without mm. those aids and then it's difficult to measure the cost of a fall that doesn't happen yes right but yes. statistically uh, over time you're going to be able to if you've got enough of a population in this you're going to be able to see what the difference is so now you're helping a population uh, live live at home longer more safely but in the, the back end, so with no access to data, but you've now got the data available through what we're doing in New Brunswick mm -hmm. to be able to measure the potential cost savings to the healthcare system as a result of doing that. So mm -hmm. that could be a substantial, substantial improvement mm -hmm. uh, to the cost of healthcare in the province. Now imagine taking that one step further and once we've developed that expertise here, assuming it would be uh, um, um, economically feasible, which I think it would be, mm. you've now established a center of excellence for that type of approach that you can export to other markets. So we're actually creating an economic opportunity out of what we perceive to be a real issue. Yep. Yep. It's a bit of a curve, but it also hovers right there too. New Brunswick is famous for its one degree of separation, like we talked about before the show. So we all know each other somehow. It takes three minutes when we meet someone new and do you know so-and-so. And at the same time, that has never given us an advantage for getting on with large scale for New Brunswick social change. Um, has or has not? Hasn't. Okay. Because because we'll talk about, well, we're smaller, we can be the Petri dish, we can be the place where the experiment happens, like you just described. But we're also stuck. Amalgamation is a great example of where we Sussex Corner just couldn't figure it out with Sussex. The Upper Riverview and Moncton have its long history of trying to get past some history and get into what the new version looks like. Fredericton in the outlying areas will always talk about internal city services and external costs. And so somewhere in there, I started to wonder when doing my homework, will something like this technology and application technology and you doing your dots, you know, all these yeah. pins, will we finally manage to get past the human element that New Brunswick, 750,000 people. And if we can figure out how to get not all on the same page, but mostly on the same page, then the little province could make a huge leap forward. We could have had a, an airport 25, 30 years ago, but the three mayors just couldn't find common ground with it. They were each busy representing their turf, and a moment kind of came and went. We, we could have had a whole other infrastructure in place the past 25 years. Those examples, you know, yeah. it's the human side to the application of right. what this could be. Just speaking on that, you get to drill down. And let's really drill down. <laughs> Good. Right? Well, that's what we're Real here for. Real drill down. What, and, and you get at ground zero. And ground zero is trust. And we've talked about that. It's trusting communities with communities and cities. It's, it's uh, uh, English, French, small community, large community. Uh, you know, when you go through all that, it's, sit down at the table and say, okay, it's 10 to 12. We get 10 minutes on, on our clock to figure this out. Because if we don't, somebody else is going to figure it out for you. Yeah. Uh, we had a city that just got $22.5 million to prop up their local, their local economy. Uh, you know, and, and really, uh, it's just that why that happened? Well, urban sprawl, big, big, big blue-collar businesses left offshore. Yeah. So when, when, you, when you have a city and get decimated like that, it, it's hard to recover. 
Yep. So now uh, the province has to step in and say, listen, we, in the next three years, we can help you out. There's conditions to that. You've got to make, instead of, look, I want, we want a brand new 65 inch flat screen television. <laughs> Do you really need it? Yeah, you need to fix your uh, your roof because you get a hole in it. So why don't you look after your needs first? Yeah. And then if you're in a position, maybe knock off one of those wants. And that's where we get to. We get to build trust up with, with our, our uh, communities. It's, we get to say, but we're in this together. Yeah. Sit down and, and come to some decisions that's good for the region. Look ahead. You might lose a little in a short game, but in the long game, you're going to be sustainable. Yeah. And when you, the planners say, look, if you have 100 houses on a street, the services, those 100 houses is paid for. But if you have one house on the same kilometer street, who's paying for those services? Yeah. But in this province, and I've always said, you always have a right to where you want to live, but there's cost to everything, whether you live outside the city or the town or villages or you live within. So we have to get at there the, the basic saying, the small community say, listen, just leave us alone, we're fine. Well, no, everybody's being touched by this. So as soon as we figure this out, we can get on the road to prosperity. Because as you know, Dennis, economic plan after economic plan and throwing money at this and throwing, yeah. but are we, any, are, we, are, we, are we any farther? Yeah. If you have a house, it's asset management. Look after your house. If you can extend, say, look, I might, if I look after things I, before I put any money in, I can get another five years out. Just like the communities, asset management and Lean Six Sigma. It's yep. their business theories that, that, that communities now right across the country the world are applying that with Lean Six Sigma is doing things more efficiently with less resources. And, and those resources, you apply them when you really need them. With asset management is is you know you look after it now instead of this life thing is 25 years let's say, try to extend it to 30 years yeah. so you're saving money so that's where we got to get that and there's some of the examples yeah great I great, would, great. I, I would build on what Eric says there and you mentioned trust two or three times yeah um, I'm writing a report on this process and my tagline for the report is going to be innovation at the speed of collaboration and trust. Uh, stealing a line from Stephen M. R. Covey, who wrote a book, uh, Trust Speed, something like Speed at the Sp Something at the Change Speed of at Trust. The speed of trust. Correct, yes, yeah, sorry, yes. But um, a specific example of that, I don't think you just wake up on a Monday morning and say, okay, I trust you now, right? Yeah. Trust is built over through relationships and time. And I think one of the advantages we have in New Brunswick is that because we are one degree of separation, we can quickly build our reputation or destroy our reputation, preferably build it. Mm. But I'll give you one example, for a concrete a concrete example. So um, New Brunswick is divided into 12 uh, regional service commissions, right? So sort of by county, some of these regional service commissions have a larger center in them, like Fredericton, Moncton, and St. John, and some are rural, like Charlotte County and McAdam and Harvey are in one. Uh, regional Service Commission. The Regional Service Commission in the Southeast, so includes Moncton, Dieppe, and Riverview, but also includes uh, Capilay and Shediac and Hillsborough and Alma and, and uh, um, um, Sackville, for example. From a purchasing perspective, um, Fredericton, Moncton, and St. John work together to do buying on certain products and services that make sense to bulk buy on. Moncton does that with Dieppe and Riverview as well. But the smaller communities don't have an opportunity to do that. Hmm. So to pick something very simple, fire hydrants, for example, like Eric was talking about asset yes. management. So perhaps in 2018, Capel A needs to buy 15 fire hydrants and Sackville needs to purchase 27 and Alma needs to purchase 15. Why not put in one purchase order for 52 yep. fire hydrants, right? They're going to get a savings. So this is where I think... There's a lot of potential in the regional service commissions to play a positive role. And that particular regional service commission, because it's one of the largest, they have a lot of resources to be able to assist the smaller communities in their region. But these regional service commissions also work together. They meet once a month to compare notes and share best, practice, best practices. So who's to say that you can't pilot a program like that in the southeast, then maybe a year or two later, you've rolled that out into all of the, all of the smaller communities around the province, and there's you know there's there's a uh, a simple process that can happen. 
human-centered, a process-centered from a you know a community management perspective. Yep. Uh, it doesn't need a lot of IT to do that, right? You can use a spreadsheet at first, yep. but at least you're building building relationships between uh, communities in, in one simple uh, context. Yep. Part of what you describe reminds me of conversations with Don Otario and Edouard Alain when we talked about CDC, up at San Cunimento of St. Anne, and local food grown and produced and, and done as a social entrepreneurship program, and mm -hmm. that was three years ago we had that conversation. Um, I know that that southeast corner on their food management strategy are more integrated um, than we are here. So, that, you know, there are some things that um, we all have in common, So, and one of them is food. So if you want to have a conversation or find a theme or a topic where everyone will almost get on the same page quickly, um, food will be one of those unifiers. Yes. Um, has that surfaced in your world? Well, yeah, yes. and it's, it's, it's here. I mean, you, you see where the, uh, the, the gardens are, the public gardens. You know, people go in there, and, and, and I'll say, it's open to everybody. We're, you know, we know some new, new, uh, new refugees and immigrants come into the city, and uh, they'll walk or take the bus over, and, uh, and because they're used to that, they'll grow their own food and vegetables. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.